Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome back to the 8th Annual Life Sciences and Society Symposium, Food Sense. And um, we have a wonderful lineup for you this afternoon. We're going to have two speakers, um, both of whom I'm very excited about. And then after that, we're going to have a panel discussion. The panel discussion will start with uh, a short introduction by Daniel Pliska, who's the chef here on campus of the, um, at the Alumni Center. And um, then all of today's speakers uh, will be there to collectively um, answer questions about sort of the whole lineup of the day. So if you've, if you've found that you've been thinking um, all day over the course of several talks about ideas that um, sort of draw them together, that are overlapping, that you'd like to address to more than one person, that will be your opportunity to do so. Um, I, uh, I, well, I wanted to also let you know what next year's topic is going to be on. So we have a vague topic for next year. I want you all to keep it in mind for mid-March of 2013. Um, we're interested in looking at culture, and you can immediately see why I said this is a vague topic. Culture is, of course, huge, but what, I'm really, what I really mean is the fact that people live community, communally in societies, right, in a way that other um, animals don't. And uh, what we've noticed over the last decade is that this is a topic that's very interesting to a large number of different um, fields who are looking at this phenomenon from different methodological perspectives. So, um, the humanities have always studied this, the so, uh, sociology and the social sciences have always studied this from different perspectives, but now there are also um, evolutionary uh, methodologies for looking at human communal living, and those three kinds of methods don't often talk to each other. So that's the general direction that we're going. We obviously need to hone it, and in order to do that, we need help from a planning committee. There are about four or five of us already, and we would love for you to join us if you're interested in taking part in planning that um, event. So I'd like to bring to the stage uh, Jill Lucht, who's a research assistant in agricultural economics and MU Extension, and she's going to introduce our first speaker. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Um, our next speaker is the award-winning chef at Justice Drugstore in Smithville, Missouri, uh, a restaurant he co-owns with his wife, Camille Eckloff. The Justice Drugstore gets its name from its setting. Uh, Jonathan and Camille fulfilled their lifelong dream of owning a restaurant by converting his family's storefront, a 1950s drugstore, um, into an upscale dining experience in the heart of the heartland. The restaurant features dishes made from locally produced foods, raised by small family farms and artisans, and by the wild forest, and we were just talking about that, um, and has received excellent re reviews from publications such as Travel and Leisure, the New York Times Sunday Magazine, and Bon Appetit. In 2007, the Justice Drugstore was a semi-finalist for the James Beard Award for Best New Restaurant, and Justice was a 2011 semi-finalist for Best Chef Midwest. So on a wintry day in January 2011, I had the pleasure of meeting Jonathan for the first time. He and Camille hosted a group of beginning farmers for, for lunch as part of a tour of entrepreneurial farm and food ventures in the Kansas City area. We were arriving after a morning at Chateau Dairy, which is one of my favorite um, small businesses in Missouri, and Paradise Meats. As the snow started to fall, we were thrilled to listen to Jonathan tell us the story of his restaurant and the importance he places on appealing to all of the senses during the dining experience. We were also impressed as he provided samples of butter from Chateau Dairy um, and talked about his relationship with Paradise Meats in securing unique cuts of meat from animals raised with care by family farmers within a stone's throw of the restaurant. Um, Justice Drugstore has become a key player in the emergence of artisan agriculture in the Kansas City region and it's a trend that's celebrated by farmers and eaters alike. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Jonathan Justice for his talk about the theater of dining. Hello, how's everybody? Um, I, uh, I know that everyone's just had lunch and is probably a little drowsy, and uh, I want to tell a couple of very short stories um, before I get started on what I'm actually going to speak about. Uh, Mr. Paul Breslin here, uh, just moments ago, was giving me a bad time about my attire and said it was very uh, circa uh, Civil War. And uh, 
And, and I said, I reminded him that, you know, Escoffier, the great French chef, developed the brigade system, which is the division of labor and the hierarchy of the kitchen based on the military. And, and it reminded me, he said, well, you've got these useless buttons. And I said, no, they're not useless. When you spill something on yourself, this comes undone, and you switch it over, and you can cover that. And, and I don't spill things on myself, by the way. Like, <laughs> but it reminded me of a story of, of an English captain, a ship's captain on a schooner in the Caribbean, and his, his um, uh, watch on, in the crow's nest said, Captain, there's a pirate ship on the horizon. And he said, mate, fetch me my red shirt. And the mate says, why am I getting you a red shirt? He says, so if I get injured, they cannot tell that I am hurt. And then from the crow's nest, the watch says, Captain, I see six ships on the horizon. He said, mate, fetch my brown pants. <laughs> All right, now I have another story that has nothing to do with perception. Um, I hope I don't offend too many people. The, where I live, uh, there's a uh, uh, University of Missouri farm extension over in Platte City, and uh, uh, I'm going to change the names here. But there's a gentleman over there named Bob Miller who uh, goes out around the farms, of course, and uh, checks on people. And, out off of County Highway KK down a long gravel driveway is Pat Heath. And uh, Pat Heath is a farmer and uh, does row crops and has pigs. And um, Bub was going out to the farm to check on him. And he gets down the long lane where there used to be this two-story farmhouse. And, and the farmhouse is gone. There's a brand new home. And Bub goes to the door and knocks on the door. And there's nobody there. And as he's going back to his truck, this pig comes around the corner of the house. And it was an odd sight. It only had three legs. And as he got to his truck, he saw Pat down by the, bad, uh, the paddock. And he's coming up to greet Bub. And uh, Bub says, Pat, how are you doing? And Pat says, Bub, I'm doing well. And Bub says, it looks like farming is going well for you. Uh, you've got a brand new home. You must have done well in the last few seasons. He says, the last few seasons haven't been good, but Bub, don't you know that this house was not born out of prosperity. It was born out of tragedy. And he says, what do you mean? And he says, well, do you see that three-legged pig running around here? And he says, yeah, I did. What was that about? He says, let me tell you about that pig. He says, last fall, just around the harvest, I was upstairs in the old farmhouse lying next to my wife, and the kids were down the hall. And I woke up, and that pig is in my face, snorting and licking me, and, and I woke up, I was trying to figure out what was going on, and I realized I smelled smoke. And as I got up, and I got the family out of the house, and we got out, and the house burned to the ground. There was nothing left. That pig had broken in the front door, gone up the stairs, woke us up, and saved my life, saved my entire family's life. He said, that's amazing. So he lost his leg in that, in that horrible fire. I says, no, 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 nothing like that. Let me tell you, this spring, you remember how wet it was this spring? This is a few years ago. And... Uh, he said, I was mowing down near the pond, and I got too close to the pond, and the tires nearer the pond sunk down to the mud a little bit, and the tractor flipped over, trapping the inside of my leg. And my face was just under the water. I could see the sky and clouds, and I, I couldn't get up. And that pig broke through the paddock and ran down to the pond and got down and got a snout up under the back of my head, and I started screaming. And Otis St. John up here on the hill, up at his barn, was at his barn, and saw that and ran down with a grain shovel, and that soft mud was able to extract my leg and get me out of there. And Bob says, that's amazing. He's an amazing pig. He, so he lost his leg down in, around the tractor in that accident and says, no, no, no. Bob, you don't eat a good pig like that all at once. <laughs> I see the jaws drop. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's bad. I'm sorry. Please forgive me especially uh, vegetarians and vegans. I am truly sorry. That is a, a very disturbing story. Um, I feel like what I want to talk about maybe is going a little bit too deep into um, another speaker here. Uh, Hildegard has uh, written a textbook on what I want to talk about. If I had realized that before I decided to do this, I might have spoken about something else. There's nothing worse than talking about something with someone who might be in the room who knows infinitely more about it than you do. <laughs> said, 
But... <laughs> and the double press, that's right. Uh, I am sweating profusely. Uh, actually, that's from too much coffee. Uh, you know, a few years ago, actually, I must talk about something last night. I was, uh, I was talking to Todd Kleiman last night, and, and uh, Mike Odette over at Sycamore brought up an article he had written about um, this this elusive chef named Peter Chang going around the South. And one of the things that struck me was that in this story, Todd was talking about this, to him, this revolutionary Szechuan cooking that, that he was having. It was a revelation to him as he was eating it. And he became obsessed with this chef. And this chef like, would never stay anywhere very long. He kept moving on and moving on and moving on. And as Todd tracked him, and eventually, this is in the Washington, D.C. area, that the chef goes down to Atlanta, and then Todd finds out he's down there, and he flies down to Atlanta because he just, he's become so obsessed with this chef, and he goes down and he eats it. And the food at that point was no longer the cutting-edge exotic food that he had it as he remembered it. It became his comfort food. It was the same food. His perception of that food had, had changed dramatically. And this happens to all of us. We have, as we grow up, these personal experiences that become prisms and filters and uh, uh, spotlights on how we perceive things older. So you have these individual biases, but then we have cultural biases, and then we have these universalisms as a species that, you know, that we might find uh, as good or bad or pleasant or unpleasant. Maybe sometimes the pleasant and unpleasant are the same, and it becomes something more cerebral, and so then as you um, look at something. I, I think about it. I was talking last night. If, if you were, I had a meal in San Francisco recently at a restaurant called Saison. And when I was done with the meal, I was, I don't know, offended is not the right word. I was intrigued. It was a really hard meal to get through. And I thought, if I were living in post-World War II and was a, fa a fan of big band era and heard Charlie Parker for the first time, that might be the same feeling. Or when you go to a movie and you're like, that, I don't know, I hated that movie. But then for the next week, it's all you can think about. I mean, did you really hate it? And then maybe 10 years later, everyone's making movies like that, and we all love it. And so food is constantly evolving, and our perceptions are evolving with it. And there, how we, the disconnect sometimes between what we look at and then what we get. I had a a few years ago, a really well-known chocolatier come into my restaurant, Chris, Christopher Elbow. And Christopher Elbow makes um, uh, chocolate truffles for the rich and famous, and, uh, and people have them flown from the, these truffles from Kansas City all over the world. And uh, he now has a shop in San Francisco, and he's become very big. And he came in the restaurant. At that time, we were a six-month-old restaurant without a pastry chef, and at the end of the meal, we like to give away something at the beginning and give away something at the end, and at the end, we were giving away chocolate tr truffles. And I saw Christopher Elbow come in, and I was like, holy crap, I'm not giving Christopher Elbow a chocolate truffle that we made. <laughs> and and uh, so I'm on the line, and I'm cooking, and I'm, I'm freaking out like, through this entire meal because I obsess on everything. And, uh, and near the end of the meal, I was working on a dessert because I was doing the desserts myself at that time. I'd been playing with a corn ice cream and we'd also been playing with, we had someone that was growing uh, jack-o'-lantern heirloom corn for us, has these great big nuts on it. We were making our own corn nuts, and I really wasn't sure where we were going with it. They were fun, but th I wasn't sure what, as a texture, where I could place that in a composition. And um, I took a spice grinder, actually it was a, a magic bullet, and uh, um, ground up some of these corn nuts, and and I took a little ball of corn ice cream and rolled it into corn nuts and then rolled it in some shaved dark chocolate and then rolled that in some chocolate powder and it looked exactly like a truffle, a chocolate truffle. And I took him out to this table at the end of the meal and Christopher Elbow looks up at me and I could see it in his face. He's like, you're really going to give me a chocolate truffle? And, then, <laughs> and he, he put that in his mouth and I could just see the wheels turning and him trying to wrap around. Because not only just the temperature, it's frozen, and there's chocolate, but that's not the overwhelming flavor. And then not to mention the jarring crunch of the ground corn nut. And it took him some time, and then finally he goes, what the hell did you just give me? <laughs> <laughs> but out of context, that corn 
you couldn't tell. I mean, you, 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 mean, you know, you, you taste it and tell someone that's corn, and you see, you visual, you have the connect of the corn, and then you taste it, that's corn. But when you remove it from its context, you have no idea what it is. We're doing a dessert right now that is kind of along those same lines. It's a, um, a chocolate hickory nut cake. Uh, we originally started out um, trying to develop a dessert that uh, didn't have gluten in it, so I'm using wild hickory nuts, which are stupid expensive and hard to, uh, to find and to break open. I've got a, a, an elderly couple that get them for me. They're outrageously expensive, and they make about $3 an hour processing them. And um, you know, we take these hickory nuts and made this chocolate cake, and then I did a, uh, uh, there's a, a honeyed chocolate paint on the plate and a sour cream caramel and uh, some pieces of bacon brittle and a popcorn ice cream. And the popcorn ice cream and the bacon go really well together. It's a lot of fun. But I, uh, we did a film shoot for Kashi um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I've been buying Kashi products since the mid-'80s. It was run by uh, two people that, you know. And then I looked them up because I wanted to make sure I wasn't getting them bed with the wrong people. And I realized they've been bought by Kellogg. And I thought, well, that seems innocuous enough. And then the shoot was done. And I realized that Kellogg's owned by Monsanto. I'm like, oh, shit, what have I done? I was like, Sorry, are we in the Monsanto building? No, okay. Uh, um, I just suddenly got a chill, I'm sorry. Um, um, anyway, um, we took some popcorn and the popcorn ice cream, and because we were, this entire film was about textures, and, uh, and I was trying to show what you can do with textures and how you can play with them and mouthfeel and things like that. Uh, I do a, uh, a couple of years ago, I did a summer dish that had... Uh, fettuccine made with duck eggs, and it's a really toothsome fettuccine, and, and I wanted a textural difference in it, and we took um, the, <laughs> the great big zucchini that I grew up on that, uh, you know, it takes an affluent society to eat micro and baby vegetables. You know, when you're, when people like my parents who grew up in the Depression, you grew things as absolutely big as you could get them because you needed to feed as many people, no matter how horrible it tasted or texture or tough it was. Anyway, we had these great big zucchini that someone had left at our door with a note saying, here, have these. These are great. And so we took them, we ran them on a mandolin and made these long strands of like the shape of spaghetti of zucchini and then blanched them. And then I mixed them in with this pasta. And it was odd. When you ate it and you wrapped it around a fork, there's this textural offset. And I liken it as the same note, an octave off. And you can't tell where the pasta begins and the zucchini ends and vice versa. And, and that's fun. That creates excitement in the mouth because you have these, that, that textual difference. People, aren't, when they're eating, aren't going to uh, cere cerebrally say, ooh, textual offset, this is great. But they do realize that <laughs> in their mouth that I enjoy this, and which is what my job is. My job is to create food that people enjoy. I, I don't do classic uh, dishes. I only do original compositions. And my background is in the fine arts. And so I, I usually like to start with a concept and build a dish from the concept rather than say, I have a protein and let's put this starch and this sauce. Um, I think there's something more that can be there and a story can be told within a dish or within a meal. And going back to, I, I was telling a, an older woman, an elderly woman a couple of days ago that I was going to be speaking about this and I was talking about the contextual nature of food and, and I was thinking of two events in my childhood, three actually. I remember being young, you know, I, of course, I love sweets, and whenever, I remember once, very young, picking up um, uh, an unsweetened iced tea, thinking it was in the same, like, paper wax Dixie cup that my Coca-Cola was in, and then having that unsweetened iced tea, which was that shock. And, like, as a kid, it was like a lightning rod to my, the, you know, to my brain, the searing unsweetened iced tea that I uh, couldn't stand. And that, when you, again, you think you're going to get one thing and you get another, it's a real jar of the system. But then there's also, you have on your palate, these, you can layer these flavors on, you can have other jarring moments. Like I, I used to get a quarter, we had, I grew up in the, the pharmacy where the drugstore is and we had a soda fountain. And I got a quarter every week and to use in the soda fountain. And I'm old enough that, just barely old enough, that I remember nickel candy bars and nickel small Cokes and nickel small bags of chips. And I loved all three of those. But um, that meant I got five items a week that I could use on my, uh, on my allowance. I remember one day splurging. I got a, a small Coke and a Milky Way. And, uh, and I had a sip of the Coke, and I remember, must have been about eight years old, and it's like, oh, that's good. And I had a, a bite of that Milky Way, it's like, oh, that's good too. And I went back to the Coke, 
and just could not stand up to the sugar of the Milky Way. It's like, oh my God, that's awful. And I remember thinking, like, wow, what is that about? It was like a revelation. And we've all had this experience. One of the most beautiful things ever is the perfect orange, a Valencia orange that's been pressed and you make orange juice. And it's just such a fabulous thing, that perfect balance of sweet and acid, unless you've just brushed your teeth. <laughs> it's not any good at all. And texture, I remember another one I thought, because I loved, I had chewing gum in my mouth. One of those uh, super bubble, they'll come in a little bow tie wrap and another a penny a piece. And those were cool because I could get five of those for a nickel. And so um, I had a super I had a bubble gum in my mouth and I bought a bag of chips. And don't try this, it's not fun. Something about the texture of chewing gum with potato chip in your mouth does not work. And this, oddly, the chewing gum, no matter how long you chew, does not come back from that. And, um, but these, so as a young child, I started thinking about how we, and I was thinking about how, do you, how we perceive our foods and, and what are the catalysts that affect those. So I was talking to this elderly woman I mentioned a few minutes ago, and she was talking about, I was, I was speaking of quarters, and back in the 30s in the Depression, she, her family was very poor, and she found a quarter, and she didn't tell anybody. And she went down to her local drugstore, because the drugstore is where all the candies were sold, and she bought 25 cents worth of licorice, which was a lot of licorice. And she went home, and she hid in the barn, and she knew that she couldn't hide it forever, so she sat in one seating, she ate the entire thing. And I would have thought it would have made her sick, but it didn't. She enjoyed it. She's never been able to eat licorice since. The guilt that was associated with not sharing it and knowing her family could have used that money ruined it for her. And she said, I, to this day, I can't stand the thought of licorice. That's amazing. I mean, that's, you know, that, it's not even a bad flavor or it's, it's a completely mental thing. I have a similar, but not quite a similar experience. When I was a child at four, um, I had a hot dog. It had ketchup on it. And about an hour later, I was sick. And the hot, the hot dog had nothing to do with it. But I can't have ketchup within a mile of a hot dog. It's just, I mean, to this day, I'm 47 years old. And we, at the restaurant, we have two restaurants. We have the inside fine dining, but I also have what I call the hillbilly burger shack on the outside <laughs> that has its own menu. And we're doing hot dogs out there. And, but our hot dogs don't have meat from a, a thousand different animals in it. You know, when we grind our hot dog meat, it is from one cow. The, came from one farmer. I only buy meat from one farmer. When I get my beef, every time I get it, it came off one animal, which seems like it should be that way, but it's fairly amazing in today's world, and uh, unfortunately. So how we perceive, there's so many biases that we have and what, and what, we, what affects us, you know, and, and whether we enjoy or don't enjoy something. And, and how they work. My, my background is in painting. So when, when I was a painter working in the classic color wheel, paint is in red, yellow, blue, black, and white. And you have saturations of colors. But then in food, we have the five elements that we can taste, which is salt, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami, or savory. And they're contextual. If you take green and you put it next to blue, the green is warm, the blue is cool, perceived. If you take the green, you put it next to yellow, orange, or red, well, the green is now a cool color, and the yellow, orange, or red is a warm color. Now, if you take a sautéed onion, and you put a heavily caramelized onion next to it, I ask someone, thinking in terms of warm and cool, what's warm and what's cool? Well, the sautéed onion is cool, the caramelized onion is warm. You take the same sautéed onion, you put it next to a raw sweet vidalia, what's warm and what's cool? And you take that raw vidalia, you put it next to a green onion, or a green onion next to a kiwi, or a kiwi next to a cucumber, or a cucumber next to pine needle, or pine needle next to wintergreen distillation, how we perceive those are only within the manifestation of the context that is given to you. And they're in saturations. You know, you can have, say, you suck on a lemon. Most people don't generally find that pleasant. That's full saturation, citric acid. But then you take a few drops of lemon and put it in the water. It's the exact same flavor, diluted down, less saturation. A lot of people like lemon in their water. And so, to me, between painting and and food, there are these similarities. And to me, a composition is just a composition. And how, in say, just like in a painting, how you can manipulate how people perceive the painting or how they uh, um, like or don't like. I try to start dishes that are within a foundation of something that people find communal and familiar. But then you start twisting those around the edges to where 
it becomes, and the unfamiliar again, going back to say the corn ice cream. Corn's very, very familiar, familiar, but you take it out of that context and it becomes something wildly different. And uh, the, uh, the filters that we, that we grew up with and we live with definitely affect this. And then you have these cultural differences. In Japan, I like Japanese food. I really like Japanese food. And I can eat about anything. And in our restaurant, we, we buy whole animals. And so I have on my menu right now a dish that has pig heart and head cheese in one dish. And I'm getting ready to move to another dish that has tongue on it. Actually, I have corned beef tongue on a platter of, of I call it a farmer's platter. It's got a lot of cured meats. And, and, and I think out of, if you're going to use an animal, out of respect to that animal, use all of the animal. And I think also as a society, if we're going to be omnivores, that we're going to have to learn to not live high on the hog. And I don't know if everyone knows where that saying came from. Living high on the hog meant the wealthy ate the loins and, and the hams on the top part, and the poor ate the innards and the bellies and the shanks. And living high on the hog is eating only the good parts. This is living high on the hog is how we got um, um, Jacob's Crutchfeld, you know, uh, to make the crossover between lamb to steers to humans because we put so much pressure on by only using the good part of the lambs that farmers are having to find uses for the rest of it. So they started grinding it into feed to give to cows. And then the disease was able to make the jump from one mammal to that mammal, previously not being able to make the jump between lamb and humans. And then suddenly we've had the connection between the steer, the cow, and the human. And uh, we, I think we have to reconsider that. Uh, and uh, we definitely shouldn't be feeding animal parts to, um, to animals that are uh, vegetarian. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. I, I, by the way, I, I have a, a series of personality defects that I talk about a lot, and it's a really intense OCD wrapped in this ball of low self-esteem that works for me. But, um, <laughs> but within that, I have really bad ADD, so I tend to jump around a lot. So there's, there's no organization to this talk, but I had a lot of things I was, wanted to talk about. So going back to the Japanese. <laughs> there's fermented red beans. It's called natto. And frankly, natto to me seems like red beans bound by snot. <laughs> you pull them up with a pair of chopsticks, and there's a string of snot coming off of it. It's very, very common in Japan. I don't think anyone's offended by that in Japan. I can eat codfish sperm. I can eat monkfish liver. I can eat about anything. I cannot eat natto. There's no way. There's something about that that, that it's a cultural difference. It's not a universality as a species, but it's definitely a cultural difference. Um, that going back to, I was thinking, I think uh, Todd Kleiman, going where I started with the article that he was writing about Peter Chang, talking about uh, the, the purest, the real Chinese Sichuan that he was eating that Peter Chang was making was so different than what he had ever experienced. And, and there were cultural differences. And, and he, in this article, he says he was having frustration with not everyone understanding how great this was. But then he's wondering in his own mind, is it really that great, or do I just think it's great? And uh, maybe both. And I, I find that a lot. That, uh, you know, I, I always question myself, and I, I put dishes out. This is the best thing I've ever done. And after two weeks of people going, why did you serve that? And I pull it back, and I think that I really, truly thought that was great. And then sometimes I'll, I'll put out a dish, and then and it sells really, really well. And then a, a year later, I look back at it, and I think, that was really a revisionist dish, or you know, it was pablum and banality, and, and why did I serve that? And I thought it was good at the time. But other people liked it, too. I mean, so, you know, and then sometimes, uh, I don't like it from the beginning, but staff says, this is great, let's serve it. And uh, so we have all these different uh, perceptions on, on why something is good and why it's not. And why we have these, you can quantify somewhat, but Hildegard is actually the person to ask this question. The methodology in, in her book, I'm talking about on how to get through all of those, uh, you have to get through all those biases if you're doing a scientific research study and that boggles my mind to have the cross-references to be able to do that. But I did, uh, I think this in perception, I think that's really what I wanted to speak about. That I think you had 25 minutes of questioning that were, I could go on, but I, I don't want everyone to start fading. <laughs> Open up the, the audience for questions and please stand at the microphone in the center.
you have a question for Jonathan? Oh, someone help me out. <laughs> Actually, if you have any questions about the restaurant or about farmers, it doesn't even have to be about the subject. Um, oh, thank you. So I, I wanted to make a, a, a comment or an observation about the, the balance of flavors. So I don't, I'm not a, a pop drinker. I personally find it too sweet, I don't like it. But I have a deep appreciation for the flavor of cola. So, I mean, I don't know that I would pick on Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola or what have you, but I think the cola flavor is brilliant. Like the, the, the complexity and the balance of it has given it an appeal that, that is truly global. I don't think you can go to any place on the planet anywhere where people don't actually like the flavor of cola. And I'm, I'm in awe of this. But I have access to chemicals that block sweet taste. And one of the single most disgusting things I've ever experienced in my entire life is the taste of Coke or Pepsi or any kind of cola with the sweetness in it completely blocked. If you get rid of that, whatever is left afterwards, what, whatever is there, is so god-awful. So it's clear to me that the sweetness is what binds all that together and balances it. And I, I think that's, it, the, the power of that is amazing. So if you have any comments on like, you know, binding and balance and things like that, I want to hear more. Yeah, I'm chomping at the bit. I, uh, I have a lot uh, about that. I, I grew up on Coca-Cola. I mean, literally. My family sold Coca-Cola from 1914 to 2001. Uh, as an adult, I find it obscenely sweet. And, but I am real sure if you take the sweetness out of Coca-Cola, you've got bitter. I mean, the, the, uh, the coca and the caffeine, I mean, they're all about bitter. If you think about coffee, and coffee is a good example, I think, of a composition or lemonade, but I think coffee is better. It's more complex. Coffee is about bitter. And, and bitter is a beautiful thing. And it's something people say they don't like bitter, but it's one of the only five things that we taste that we know of anyway. And by the way, the, I'm going to mention real quick Japanese. Umami uh, was talked about in the early 1800s by a Japanese scientist. Western scientists, I believe, did not find the actual taste buds for umami until this century, until about 10 years ago. But coffee is about bitter. Caffeine is about bitter. So when people are putting, say, milk and sugar or cream and sugar in Milk's got acid in it, it's got lactic acid, it's got sugars in it, and then if you're adding sugar, then you can add more sugar. So now you're getting a balance between bitter, acid, and sweet. Um, I, I would like to take a minute to talk about a dish I did, because I, when I was a kid, um, I was really into root beer and into Coke, and it, it vacillated between the two. And um, I used to take, we had an old Coke machine, if you pulled the lever halfway down, you just got syrup out of it. And, and I didn't grow up on maple syrup. I grew up, real maple syrup. I grew up with Aunt Jemima, Mrs. Butterworth, Log Cabin. These are flavored corn syrups. And we served breakfast in the, in the drugstore on the weekends, and we served lunch all, all seven days. But I would take waffles or pancakes and do root beer syrup over them. <laughs> and it was phenomenal. It was really good. And then um, later, then I, I'd take um, root beer syrup with vanilla ice cream and vanilla milk and make a deconstructed root beer float and, and, and be a root beer shake. And I don't know how many people have seen the movie Ratatouille, but there's a, a pivotal moment in the movie where this critic is sitting in the restaurant, and he has been served Ratatouille, an ultimate peasant dish. And this is talking about in perceptions. And he is mortified that in a restaurant of this caliber, they're really are going, they're going to serve me Ratatouille. And he's almost furious of the idea. And he takes a bite, and he goes through this tunnel vision to his childhood. And in the scene, there's an open door of this farmhouse, this French farmhouse, and there's a bicycle on the ground in the back, and the wheel is lolloping. It's been, and I used to be a bicycle messenger. We called that a taco wheel. And uh, he's got bloodied knees, and he's crying. He comes in, and his mother has sat him down, and he's eating the ratatouille, and suddenly he's back in the restaurant, and he's got a pin in his hand, and he just drops it. And there's this scene of the slow motion pin dropping on the floor. I had that moment with root beer. We have, <laughs> you mentioned Chateau Farms earlier. They make the finest milk and cream and butter I have ever worked with. I've done two stints in France. I ran a kitchen in the south of France. I've never worked with a dairy product 
that is that pure and that beautiful. It is an amazing product. Well, they also do these flavored milks, and he does a root beer milk. And when we first opened, one of his drivers left a sample of the root beer milk. It wasn't even for sale yet, and I took a drink. And it, poof, it was like straight back to my childhood, and my OCD went into overdrive. And I was like, root beer, root beer, root beer, root beer. And, it's like, so I, and I, I started doing all this research on root beer, and we decided I'm going to make a root beer. I'm going to make the finest root beer I could ever think of. And then years ago, my wife had, because I have these you know, obsessive tendencies, uh, I, was, I was buying, we were poor, and I was buying expensive artisanal root beer, and we're living in San Francisco. And she says, why are you buying that expensive stuff? There's no way you can taste the difference. She lines up 13 root beers in front of me. I'm talking about A&W and Barks and uh, Dad's, and there was like a mixture of cheap, there was like maybe four or five artisanal. I think there was Thomas Kemper and Henry Weinhardt's and Pyramid. In the Northwest, there are these breweries that are making artisanal root beers. And um, lined them all up, and I got 12 of 14 right, and I had two of the artisanal switch. I knew exactly which every one of them was, which is incredible because I have an incredibly poor memory. But anyway, going back to this dish, so then I, we went out and um, I found some of my grandfather's as an apothecary. He had root beer recipes, and at the time, at this time, I had a pastry chef, and her grandfather had been a pharmacist apothecary, and she had some root beer recipes. And uh, I didn't mention this before. We have two stills in our restaurant. We distill our own essences. We don't make alcohol, but we go out in the woods, and we get flowers and roots and barks, and we distill things like cherry bark, or right now, um, uh, there's a particular heirloom peach that grows in an area that's called Little Dixie that is a, uh, um, an, era, uh, uh, an area of fauna that is different from anywhere on Earth that was created by a glacier coming up and forming the Missouri River and receding and dropping all these seeds in an area that we're, from not, we're not from here. And anyway, so there's some really unusual plants within this area. And we made this root beer that I was really proud of, and I thought, this is the finest root beer I've ever had. And we did some after-dinner drinks where we did some alcoholic drinks with a little bit of like maple vanilla ice cream and a root beer float with alcohol as a little giveaway at the end. And I thought, that's not what I want. I want to do something that's about the essence of root beer but really isn't root beer. And I obsessed on this for a long time. And I was lying awake one night, and I suddenly thought of down in East Texas, I've heard of Dr. Pepper Braised Short Ribs. I've never had it before. And that led me to think about Coca-Cola Braised Briskets in New York. And then I thought, what about a root beer braised brisket? I was really excited and we went down and we braised this brisket and root beer. It was really not very good. And, I, and then I was really disappointed and then I thought about it over the next several months and I thought, you know, just because this was a perfect drinking root beer, and this goes back to because root beer is again about bitter. Without the sweet, it's all about bitter. And it was too bitter for the brisket. So we backed off the molasses. We backed off the celery seed distillation. We backed off the anise distillation. And we really pushed the honey and the sassafras on it and the sycamore bark. And then I tried it again, and we got this amazing thing that was unlike anything I'd ever had. But now all I had was a meat, and I needed a full composition. So I started thinking about the other things that were in it. Well, the celery seed was easy, so we took celery root puree, and that became the base. And, and all the time I thought, I want carrots on this dish. And we were, every time I was thinking about this dish, I was moving into a new season, so the dish kept changing in my mind because what you want to serve in July is not what you want to serve in December, especially in a braised meat like a brisket. And we were working with these carrots, and, and I thought, you know, I bet I could get vanilla in these carrots. It would be fun. So we did this vanilla butter carrots that I really liked. And then and the, initially, the first I wanted to do, it was coming into a summer, I wanted to do a salad on top, and I was thinking about a winter green vinaigrette. I thought, that would be Fabulous. It was horrible. It was like chewing gum as a salad. It was just not, and like an and adult chewing gum, not sweet child chewing gum. And I set it aside again, and then later that fall, one day I just suddenly thought, honey sassafras vinaigrette. We did it over wild arugula, and I put it out, in the, and everyone, the staff said it was ecstatic about this dish. And, and I was getting ready to run it, and at the last minute I thought, you know, I grew up on smoked meats. I'd never had a braised meat in my life before I moved from Missouri because, I mean, Kansas City, I mean, it's all about smoke. And I thought, well, what if we put something on this dish that was smoked but not the obvious, the meat? And so we had been playing with this smoked butter, and it was way too strong to use by itself, so I emulsified the smoked butter into the vanilla butter, and we had the smoked vanilla butter, and we put it on the carrots. And it was fun. When people would eat the dish, they would say, that's the best smoked brisket I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> there was no smoke on the brisket, of course. But anyway, what led me on that diatribe was the bitter, root beer, Coca-Cola, they're all about bitter without the sweet. Hi, 
I have celiac disease, which requires that I maintain a gluten-free diet. Sure. Of the speakers that we've heard so far this weekend, you're the first one to mention gluten-free cooking. Right. Could you talk to us about your experiences with gluten-free cooking, what you've learned not to do, and what you've learned to do? Thank you. I, I don't know what it is that we're doing that, you know, I don't think that this is something that's been around for a long time. Five years ago, gluten intolerance was not in any, not in my lexicography. I mean, it was not, it was uh, unheard of. And I can't, I mean, every week I have people that come through that say they have celiacs and, and definitely you have to accommodate it. I mean, there's, it's a big chunk of the population. And, and I don't know what this is, explosion is about or where it's coming from or what we're doing in our food supply that's causing it. I suspect it's something in our food supply. Um, and, you know, other than for me to try to acknowledge it, just like I do peanut allergies and other nut allergies and things I, you know, um, um, you know, I, I, it's the number of people that say they have it um, is immense. Um, I do think, and I'm sure, I mean, not, I don't want to, uh, but celiac is a very, very serious disease. For those of you who don't know, it's an autoimmune deficiency disease, or it's an auto, it's an immune deficiency disease, and it is very, very serious, and I, but I do suspect I do have some customers that, that are, it's easier to say they have celiacs to say that I'm on a diet and I don't want starch, but, but you have to take each one of them very, very seriously. I have people that come in and say, I have a nut allergy. Now, their nut allergy, their tolerances may be extremely fine on a molecular level, or it may be that, well, it'll make my you know, lips you know, swell a little bit and welt, but, but I have to take it no matter what to, you know, to the extreme and make sure that no one gets that nut or gets, uh, um, gets um, the uh, starch, I'm sorry, I'm probably speaking too softly, gets flour, uh, gluten. But it, it, sometimes it gets really hard because you have, people have these combinations. Um, <laughs> I'm a vegan, uh, with uh, soy, nut, and gluten allergies. <laughs> and it gets really, really difficult because um, my, you know, my obsessive nature means I, I don't want to just throw out some sauteed vegetables. I have to put out a composition. When I was a painter, if someone came to me and said, I want you to make a painting to match this couch, I would say, you're looking at the wrong person. This is not something that I'm interested in. But it becomes, it becomes very difficult. And, and we do have a lot of allergies, and the combinations of them um, can become maddening, but they are definitely real. I don't know if that's, um, I don't know what, other than for me to try and make sure I have something available. And we're really, really careful in our kitchen about always thinking about cross-contamination. And, and not just in making people sick. Think about this. We have, um, in the summertime, we're using a watermelon in our gar manger station. That's where appetizers are coming from. And our bar will use watermelon scraps and juice them. And I've had my bartender get angry because the person on that salad station cut watermelon after they had cut shallots or garlic or onion and then gave them to the bar. <laughs> and it's not pleasant. <laughs> and so so we, we are always talking about cross-contamination, not just for making people ill, but also just for keeping the integrity of flavors. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, earlier about uh, wanting to use the whole animal, and you said the word head cheese. Yes. I remember my grandparents were from uh, Norway and they ate a lot of head cheese and blood sausage and here in the States we, I guess the perception is, well that's kind of a bad thing to eat. So how does, uh, it was okay the way my grandma prepared it. However, on the other hand, I've had some head cheese that were, as uh, he pronounced, nausea inducing. Yes. So. <laughs> How does one, as being a chef, take this food and make it presentable and palatable to an American palate? I'm glad you brought that question up because that was actually something I meant to talk about and my ADD made me skip. Um, using the whole animal, a lot of the reason that people aren't is it is a perception problem. And I think a lot of that perception problem goes back to the whole the high on the hog concept. Um, after the Great Depression and then going into World War II, and after World War II, we had this great economic expansion. I think that people felt like, I don't have to eat that anymore, therefore I'm not going to. And when that happened, then it became this public perception, that is not good food, that's scrap food, we're above that now. And then now we have to go back to that again, because we, I think that, again, uh, if we're going to use animals, we need to respect them by using the whole thing, and for carbon footprint, and, 
and everything associated with that sustainability, we need to be eating the whole animal. Now, you bring up a couple of things also with not just perception but reality. My mother was just in, my mother's 89 and she's a very spry uh, woman of four foot 11 and uh, she was in Scotland um, last summer and she was talking about all the haggis she had and she said it was really horrible except this one that was beautiful and I think what had happened is that you, know, you get even in Scotland or somewhere where you have a, something that's a, a cultural icon where no one's making it themselves anymore. I think she had over and over and over again factory pre-made haggis. I had, uh, actually I was coming back from here, from here in Columbia a few years ago when I stopped at a, uh, an Amish country store on, on, I think it was on 50, and I, I don't want to burn on any Amish country store, but I had some head cheese and it was horrible. It had hair in it. I don't mean human hair, it had pig hair in it. And I thought, wow, you didn't even take the time to remove the hair off this animal before you made it. I, I, I was in France almost a year ago right now and I was in a bar. That's not unusual, by the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, but what happened was I'm walking down the street, and, and I'm really a wine drinker, but we had been on a wine tour, and we were about halfway through it, and it was a working trip, and I'd already tasted probably in five or six days easily three or 400 wines, and, you know, and I was kind of wined out, and I'm walking by a bar that served the, the Belgian beer left on tap. I'm like, oh, man, I'm like, craving a beer. So I go in, I'm sitting at the end of the bar, and I see this bartender behind the bar, and he's doing a technique on carrots called tournain, which is making small eight-sided carrots. And this is something that you learn in culinary school. No one at home would ever do this. And I was watching him do these perfectly cut tournade carrots, and I thought, this gentleman is definitely culinarily trained. And in France, they take their culinary schools very, very seriously. And it's, a, of course, a lifetime pursuit. And coming from someone, I didn't start cooking professionally until I was 33, so I, I'm... Um, I'm not the norm in any way, but uh, I'm watching him make this, and, and I ask him, uh, tu fais là? what are you making there? And, uh, and he said he was making, preparing the next day's uh, plate of the day, the plat de jour, and it was tête de veau, and that's veal head. And, uh, and I've had veal head, and it was really not good. And, but I was watching him tourner this carrot, and I thought, anyone that spends that amount of time on the carrot, what are these amount of time are they spending on the rest of the preparation because it's really hard to break down a veal's head and you have to separate all these different parts and they're all cooked in wildly different ways. You've got the sweet breads and the cheeks and the tongue and the brains and then it's served with a, usually with uh, steamed uh, baby potatoes and carrots and parsnips and a sasque biche and a sasque biche would be the beautiful, uh, the beautiful grandmother to what is our ugly stepchild of tartar sauce. And, it, and so the, the next day, I, I, I cooked for, um, um, this is actually, I don't mean to drop names, but it was a lot of fun. There's a, a really well-known winemaker in the Northern Rome named uh, Jean-Louis Chave, and we got to stay in, at their personal residence, and I cooked for them some duck breasts that were from a local farm that we went out and picked, and, and we did the, uh, uh, the butchering ourselves right there and, and the evisceration, and, uh, and we were cooking these duck breasts over... Uh, Syrah vines of the finest Syrah grown on earth. And uh, we had this amazing meal. And the next morning, we had to be in the vineyards at 9.30 in the morning. And this is 10 miles. We were in Ternon. We were 10 miles out of Tain Hermitage where this bar was. And this bartender said he was going to be serving this the next day, but only until 1 o'clock. And it was about 34 degrees, and it was raining. And I got up at 6 o'clock in the morning after partying with these people until 2 and walked 10 miles through the rain to go to this bar, completely drenched, and to have this tête de veau. And I'm sitting there, and there was a, an old, all these old men. Are, horse racing is very big in France still. And, and equipe is the, the horse racing form. And there, this old man had a, uh, um, what do you call it, a safety, um, safety pin holding his glasses together. And he's eyeing me over his paper because I was the outsider and was giving me these dirty looks. And I, I ordered a coffee, and the bartender came over, and I said, you know, is it too early to have the tête de veau? And he says, no, absolutely not. And uh, so he goes back into the kitchen. He's gone about 10 minutes. He comes back and brings, it's, it's, it's 8.30 in the morning, and I've got this big platter of, of veal head. And, uh, and I thought, I can't have this without a glass of wine. So he brings me over a glass of wine, and now the old men are looking over the racing forms, nodding and smiling at me. And so <laughs> <laughs> it was the most amazing meal I'd had in a couple of years. And so... 
but going back to the, it's all in taking time. We, we don't take time in our preparations anymore. We don't, you know, we rush through everything. And so I take great pride in taking things that people have these perceptions of and making something beautiful of it. Um, you know, like some of the servers on the, I mentioned a, a, a we call it the farmer's platter. When there are things, I do do blood sausage. They will say, well, that's bon and noir. And which is the French term. I don't like using foreign terms because I'm not doing foreign food. I'm doing what I call country food on steroids. I'm trying to do a food that, I live in Clay County, Missouri, and I'm trying to do a food that represents Clay County, Missouri. I don't do seafood. My background is as a seafood chef. When I get on my roof, I don't see an ocean. And salmon and halibut or sustainable seafoods don't say anything about Clay County. And so, uh, um, but I, I, I think it's important to take great pride in everything, but those parts require special care. And that special care is, uh, um, is what is needed to make them taste good. By, by the way, do you guys notice that I don't give yes or no for an answer? <laughs> this one. Okay. What's the name of your restaurant? Oh, that's a, oh yeah, it's Justice Drugstore. Justice? Drugstore. Drugstore. And it where was, is it located? It's in Smithville, Missouri, uh, 20 minutes north of downtown Kansas City. Okay. Um, I'm coming. Thank you. It's, uh, um, it's in the building that was, as mentioned, my uh -huh. grandfather built the pharmacy. My, my mother was a pharmacist for 45 years there. My grandfather, started around, <laughs> my grandfather started around the corner in 1914, and um, the property where we are has been in my family for 172 wow. years, and there was a harness shop there that my great-grandfather had, mm -hmm. and a flood in 1955 uh, swept away this harness shop, and my grandfather was renting a space, built this um, 1950s kind of modernist building, Great. and he died six years later. And my mother, who uh, had a doctorate, and he, my grandfather went to two years to a pharmacy school in 1913, right. 1912, 1913. Mm -hmm. When my parents were moving back from uh, New York, where my father had a seat on the NYSE, and my mother asked my grandfather for a job, and he offered a job as a soda jerk. And, and she was furious, so she went to work for Ewing Kaufman and doing mm -hmm. research, which was what she'd been doing in New York. Right. After her death, my grandmother, her daughter, asked her daughter-in-law, my mother, if she would take over the store. My mother ran it for 45 years. Thank you. Um, I actually have a, a comment, too, that I'd like to add. Uh, in case I forget, because I have those moments. Let's see, the first was R, restaurant. The next is Peru, and the last one is C. So if I forget, you can help me, please. My second one is about Peru, and it goes back to our earlier question from Dr. Breslin about cola, mm -hmm. because I spent time in the Peace Corps in Peru. Um, I know that people use coca, which is no longer in Coca-Cola, but right. was once in it. Right. Um, they use it as um, a mediator for hunger and cold, and there's no sugar in it. And in fact, they have special bags that you carry your coca leaves in with a limestone, which was always interesting because they chew the limestone to release it and to release the potency of the coca. So so the limestone being alkali. Okay. So that's different than having the sweetness. However, you'll find lots of people in, in Peru and, and any country, as, as uh, Dr. Breslin said, who drink Coca-Cola with the sweet. But yeah. I was just thinking of the difference in what it does, because it does have an element of non-nutrition to a certain extent. Uh, it alleviates hunger, but it does not satisfy it. In the same way the caffeine. I mean, okay. you know, we, uh, as a society, we use caffeine and sugar and taurine in these same ways. They're mm -hmm. uh, nutritionally vacant, but we use them for our lifestyle. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, also it brings up, I really want to know this exact percentage. I've asked a few people. There have been studies done on conventional produce, vegetables, and uh, fruits. And I, I'm, I'm reluctant to throw this number out, but I think it's fairly close. In the last 50 years, our conventional produce has lost nearly 40% of its nutritional value from soil mm -hmm. depletion. Mm -hmm. It's something to think about when you're thinking about the price difference between organic and conventional. And my real question is, you, I'm interested as an artist in the color aspect. If you, would you give us one plate of a, as an example of what you think is an interesting and beautiful presentation regarding color? Well, without a visual aid, I think that'd be difficult. I think the dish I just mentioned, um, they had this, these bright orange carrots and then this green salad mm -hmm. and then coming out from underneath the, the white of the, almost pure white of the um, uh, celery root puree 
and then the real mahogany. When we do mm. our briskets, we don't really do them in a traditional way where you're braising them. We use a technique that's called sous vide. And so you, we, we put it under a vacuum seal and uh, the brisket that we're doing cooks altogether about 44 hours and it never gets over 140 degrees. So when you slice it, oh. it's still pink inside. Oh. And so if you, when you're cooking meats, if you don't let it get over that temperature, no matter how long you cook it, it won't, it won't get the color difference. But what happens, you have these proteins that are called calthacins and calpacins, and they start to denature, meaning denature proteins. If anyone's ever cooked, like say a pork chop especially, and, and you give it heat, you see, you see the pork literally shrink up. And what happens are these proteins start cinching down on each other. Mm -hmm. And then after slow cooking, then they start to unravel. So the trick what we're trying to do is by not searing first is that we try to denature those proteins and then before we serve it, then we'll sear the outside to get mm. what in smoking terms would be called the bark. Mm. And uh, you know, that's more information you. than you're Thank looking you. for, per usual for me. I think we're going to need to conclude the questions now. And um, I'll let Stephanie take over. Well, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.